Hi, my name is Thomas, and I want to tell you something about my work, my current work at One and One, and what I'm doing there for now uh, almost 10 years is dealing with disasters and preventing dis uh, disaster scenarios. Um, first, I want to give some uh, introduction about uh, why this is needed and uh, why you need long-distance asynchronous replication, not a synchronous one, for true disaster uh, prevention, uh, tr uh, disaster management, and what uh, the difference is between long distances and short distances. There's a fundamental difference, and this difference also shows up in cluster management, how to manage those if you deal with uh, particular loads and scenarios there. And I've implemented a new solution in Mars, which is now a new interface, a very easy and simple interface to SystemD. And just using SystemD as a cluster manager is uh, something which is very easy, and I ho hope that you find it useful if, if you are using Mars or similar. Okay, and of course, about newer developments, I'm in front of releasing a few new features in the next month, so probably if there are some users who will Hopefully, I want to get also a picture from you what's in your interest there. Okay, an example has went through the press in the last few months. There was a smaller disaster with some satellites. And later you could read in the press that uh, a data center failure or, or a failure inside of a data center was the reason. And switch over to another data center did not work as expected. So this is one of the cases where you need, well, the one thing is DR means disaster recovery, but many people um, think that disaster recovery is only backup. But the generic term disaster recovery can, it's not only uh, dis um, backup, uh, restore from backup, but it can also mean what I'm doing here. A better term is continuous data protection, which means um, you continuously have some backup, not daily or whatever, you have continuously the data, or almost recent uh, data, and you can switch over in almost, let's say, a few minutes or an hour or whatever, let, uh, so you will survive a disaster in a much smaller time than the restore from backup. Because if you have only backup, it may take at only a few petabytes of data, then of course it may take a few days or even a week or even much more time to restore your business. And this can be really disastrous, not only for your data center, but for your whole business. And if you are uh, in a stock uh, company, which is uh, noted in stock, then it might be even a demand from that. And uh, when talking about demands, you all know, you most of the audience is from Germany, BSI means uh, Bundesamt für Sicherheit in der Informationstechnik, so it's a German authority. And around December, they released a new paper. Here's the German title, the English title means that it's about locations of data centers for those cases where we are talking about critical infrastructures here. And you know that German, at least the German legislation has, uh, in, uh, has tightened the definitions what is a critical infrastructure. For example, if you are operating a DNS, uh, it's likely that you may fall uh, and have a certain size, of course. It might, there might be some, some chance that you are falling behind this. At the moment, it's just, let's say, a recommendation. Um, recommended, yeah. And there are also some discussions, for example, with German VDE, Verband Deutscher uh, Elektrotechniker and Engineers and so on. So they, they dislike this idea. Uh, and they have their own definitions, which is only five kilometers distance. Uh, but uh, you can think in, in um, an authority, a government authority is probably, maybe that uh, the legislation in future may be tightened in this direction. So it can, may happen that in future you may have to deal with that, even from a compliance perspective. Not only from you want to have a good service for your customer, you want to stay online, you, have, you want to be, uh, to be available, but also from even from a more serious 
uh, more than recommended somewhere in future. Okay, uh, you want to, we want to turn the red thing in a green one, and now how to do this? This is on the next slide. So, I'm going a little bit back to basics. What you see here is a classical operating system stack from Unix from the 1970s even. So you have certain layers. What you typically provide is a service to your customers or internally for your company, or which is a critical one in this case or not, whatever it means. And you have certain options for distributing this. A potential cut point to, to distribute it, it would be here at application layer and there are certain cases where this is even, I think, the best one, for example, mail queues. Yeah. It can be replicated at mail level, more fine-grained and application-specific. You can exactly read uh, the, the metadata of your mails and where it's going to and for whom is it and pre precedences and so on. So there are cases well, I think that uh, MySQL replication is also a good example. You have more fine-grained control about over con uh, transactions and so on. So there are certain cases where I would prefer the application layer. But there are other use cases uh, where you need to be more generic, like replication of file systems or of, of whole virtual machines. And here there's sometimes a question, should we do it at file system layer or at block layer? Um, and some people think that file system layer is a good idea, but it's not a good idea for long distances. The reason is on this slide, you have a caching layer in between those layers. In the kernel, it's the page cache and the de-entry cache. And one of these caches has been even uh, introduced into the kernel by myself almost 20 years ago, or around 20 years ago. So this is just my former working area in, in this. And if you want to distribute a system here at this layer, you have to deal with the number of system calls which are dealing with file systems and the number of system calls per second. And the numbers here on this slide are way too low. And a modern server with, let's say, 32 CPU threads, or let's say 64, it's no problem to get such servers, or probably you have some of them, you may have millions of syscalls per second, at least in worst case, in, in some cases. But on the below that caching layer, it's not only 1 to 100 reduction, it may be 1 to 1,000. If you have good tuned caches, it's no, uh, in, in our service, we have, I have measured 1 to 1,000 around this. So 99.9% uh, hits rate in the cache, only the cache misses, misses are appearing at the block layer. That means if you have a long distance replication to do, there's a clear answer where to do it. Please don't try it file system layer do it at a block layer. So this is, for long distance, there's no other chance in reality here. Okay, so clear, any questions for this? Well, then let's look at an example in one and one IONOS. Uh, I'm working at shared hosting Linux, and there we have uh, uh, the, this single application, well, we have multiple ap applications, but this single application is running over two data centers in two continents and the distance between the data centers is around 50 kilometers for historic reasons. And the total number of customer home, uh, the, the slides are on the internet, you can download it afterwards. You don't need to take a photo, but you can also do. Uh, this is just the raw number of customer home directories. The number of, um, of domains is slightly less. I think only s around six millions or whatever. And um, the number of inodes is also an interesting number. We have 10 billions and we have daily backup for them. So this is also a challenge, of course, because we have extremely many slow, uh, small files. And the distribution is a very interesting distribution. If you look at it, it's zip slow, it's an exponential distribution about file size. This is also a very interesting observation I have in my daily work. And the total space currently allocated, I think it's almost five in the meantime. No, the slide is not, not yet. And we have a growth rate of around 20% per year. And this is certainly a, a challenge how to deal with that. And Mars is also a solution not only for replication, but also for migration of data in the background. Because you can migrate data or file systems even if they are being modified while being migrated. And as far as I know, the only open source component which can do that uh, during operations while you have strict consistency in this system. I don't know whether it's also possible with Ceph, but I think it's, um, it's DRBD and Mars. These, these two can do it certainly. 
as constructed for this case. Okay, well, what synchronous doesn't work, and if you don't believe it, just try ISCSI over more than 50 kilometers. Or uh, try ISCSI through, let's say, a network bottleneck. Um, you can configure um, a small drop rate, let's say, say 1% or 2% packet loss, uh, just for testing, and try it, then you will see. So that, that, that's, that's very simple yeah, to test. O okay, so that means you need an asynchronous replication, and um, there you have certain options, of course. For example, the application-specific one is clear, because MySQL replication is constructed for this case. Yeah, it's just um, done by the, the developers of that application, so you are fine with that. It's clear. But uh, for generic uh, layers, you have the choice between commercial appliances and, well, I, I've, I've made some comparisons. It's around a factor of 10. Even if you get good rebates, it's around a factor of 10 for in comparison to self-built storage. So what you want, typically want to have is open source because we are not only at an open source conference because I think also it's clearly the best solution you have two main components which could do it, it's the RBD, but this is not asynchronous, and some people are thinking that it also has an asynchronous mode, but it's not really true, I will explain it later if it's interesting for you. It does some very small buffering, but it's only buffering in the TCP send buffer, and this is way too, too small. This is not working in practice. Uh, there's a reason why we migrated from DRBD to Mars in our data center with the numbers you saw before on the, first, uh, on the previous slide. So Mars has been constructed for originally for this use case, persistent buffering in a file system, in a file with log rotation, transaction logging like a database, and each write request is one transaction. This means you have, yeah, yeah, L like you ha would have a database where each write request is treated as if it is a transaction, that means you have any time consistency. That means any write request, but the problem is not the block layer itself. If you have a file system like XFS, you are not calling uh, sync or fsync all the time. So anyway, are you losing around, let's say, 10 seconds until the page flush daemon of the kernel will flush uh, the dirty pages. So for typical applications, you anyway are losing, let's say, 10 seconds or 20 seconds, or depending on your kernel parameters there, typically of course, at least for file system applications. Anyway, so this is not, uh, asynchronous replication isn't a real problem there. It doesn't really add too much to this, let's say, data loss which occurs in failure scenarios. You have some, uh, some data loss there. And if you want, I can explain why it's uh, necessarily, you, uh, because there's a cap theorem uh, which explains that. Um, here I have a small example. Um, let's assume that the application throughput is somewhat constant, which is never true in practice. It's an also an exponential distribution, but the network is flaky. So sometimes you have packet loss. For example, if you are coupling to data centers, then you will have backup traffic at night or whatever. And so you have load peaks uh, where you ha have packet loss. And packet loss is typically something which will um, introduce some very uh, flaky behavior into the network. So you have no guaranteed throughput. If you want to have it, you can spend a lot of money on having guaranteed separate lines. You can do this, but it's a cost argument against this. So what Mars is doing, if you have more application throughput than network throughput, like in this area, it just buffers in the transaction log. And if you later have a better throughput because a network bottleneck is gone, it will catch up. So that's the simple idea here. And here, just for demonstration, this would be the TCP send buffer size, which is a few megabytes at most. But in the slash Mars file system where the transaction logs are residing, you have a few, you have gigabytes or even a terabyte if you want to have. So my dimensioning recommendation is dimension the slash Mars for, let's say, a power blackout of, let's say, two days, one weekend to survive this in order to not lose any, not order to need a re full resync of, of all the data. So this is the best, theoretically best possible throughput behavior, and many people don't know that DRBD would become inconsistent during those phases. Why? 
because uh, if the application throughput exceeds the network throughput, you will get either an incident or you have to disconnect them. And if you reconnect, you have to catch up. All these areas which have to catch up have to be done, and during this catch up, you are inconsistent because the RBD cannot remember the order of requests. While the transaction log is a sequential one and records the original data as it is. So even if you have a disaster, even a rolling disaster where multiple events are occurring, then you will always have a consistent mirror, but you m it will be uh, it will reflect a state in the past at most, a former state. That's all. But the point is, you get whatever is done is consistent, and it's inside of one logical volume you are replicating. It's strictly consistent. It's strict consistency, like any ordinary block device. But between the replicas, data center A, data center B, you have eventually consistent. Okay, and uh, so we have two consistency models at two levels, which are independent from each other. So. Now, what's my talk about? About cluster management there. If you try, well, you of course, you can have some proper proprietary cluster managers somewhere. We have our own, which is, so what I'm talking in this presentation is not really in use at one one, but only in the lab at the moment. But it may happen that future versions of our internal CM3 cluster manager might use uh, the new, might be uh, then a front end for the new systemd interface because we are using systemd anyway for, for many purposes now. But our system is much, much older than systemd. Yeah? It's 20 years old now, around 20 years, constructed 20 years ago, and their systemd did not yet exist, of course. Yeah? It's clear, so... Um, well, pacemaker doesn't really work. Bec why? And there's a simple reason. Uh, uh, pacemaker has a shared disk model, which is uh, the standard model uh, originally, and it is predecessors. It's um, had this model originally from the 1980s. Um, and this model is very simple. You have one disk which cannot fail, for example, from IBM or so, which cannot really fail uh, f uh, in the 1980s. This was the preferred model. And there you have a client and you want just uh, you switch over your clients. So, and this was the original idea, the original architecture. Of course, you are right. If you shake your heads, you are right. That, of course, uh, but our m and my experience is in some uh, even another uh, group in our company tried to use pacemaker there it did not work as expected because the split brain handling is not built in and it's rather clumsy to do with so this is something which is uh, a, b a better cluster ma a true cluster manager with automatic failover is um, missing at the moment is lacking at the moment and I'm using the term cluster manager in a way which is internal use at one and one. There, cluster manager is something which is triggered manually and then does the rest. So it's not fully automatic at the moment. But of course, in, as an additional layer, it could be added to be also an automatic one. But you should implement then quorum and similar things, which would be possible with Mars metadata uh, protocols, which are already implemented, but not yet. Well, it could be one of my next next year or one, one of the next projects, for example. But not at the roadmap at the moment, at my roadmap at the moment. Now, what I'm trying to talk about is using systemd. And all of you have probably other systemd, you are probably already using systemd, whether you would like it or not. And there have been some discussions in the community about systemd. I don't want to repeat them. <laughs> it has some merits and it has also some shortcomings. But whatever is your opinion, your opinion about systemd, um, almost all distros, I think, have it now. And um, whatever you are using, you are already relying on it. So what's the po only potential problem many people see with it, I think, uh, is the monolithic architecture. Well, um, I think it's not really monolithic from a user's viewpoint because you can install unit files as you like from your own. And this is just the interface I'm using from Mars. The idea is Mars already has, since from the beginning, a dynamic resource creation and deletion operation. If you are using it, you know it. It's Mars RDM join resource leave resource. You create another replica via jo uh, join resource. Originally, you created the source via Mars RDM create resource. Similar commands are already also in DRBD. If you know DRBD, it's DRBD has taken over some parts even from Mars there. 
at leaf resource is just uh, giving up this replica and then you can recycle it for whatever reason for whatever purpose and i already have a, a macro processor internally uh, for in mars for display of let's say whatever you want to program there it's the mars rdm view command uses uh, some macros internally and this macro processor has some capabilities of doing whatever you want and this is just the idea behind the system the interface okay Let's start with an example. This is an example template which is already online at uh, the Mars repo. And this is a very trivial systemd unit template for mounting your dev Mars block device somewhere. And if you know systemd already, then you will wonder what these special symbols uh, so the add symbol and the percent symbol there. These are simply uh, the macro processor directives here. You can see that even the file name in the systemd subdirectory has some macro. This is a substitution of the resource name. So the template specifies is written only once and can be used for let's say 100 or 1000 resources in your whole system. You write it only once. Uh, and in this special example, in the first line, I'm computing another variable which is called mount here. This is the mount point. What's really done by the template is in these two lines. What is mounted? It's dev mask resource name. And the mount point is somewhere the mount point and the also the resource name. And I recommend you to consistently use the same name for both the block devices, for the mount point, for the file systems, for the ISCSI export and so, and so on. Whatever you are doing with this, or for an NFS export of this file system, use always the same uh, name because otherwise you will get confused over time. It's an inflation of names doesn't help in any way. So this is a built-in convention here. And, well, what does it do? It uh, just substitutes the dashes by slashes. Uh, you know that uh, Leonard Pettering has invented this dash uh, substitution in his unit files. If you have a mount unit for systemd, the slashes are simply, this is convention from systemd, are uh, replaced with, um, with des dashes. This is a systemd convention, not from Mars. And this is just the inverse operation, convert, the system, the unit's name back into a mount point path in with the slashes. So that's the idea here. So it calls a substitute operation, which is a regular expression substitute here by a microprocessor. And then you compute the mount point. And here, well, I think if you know system D, it's, is, it, is it understandable for you? Okay. I, d I don't need to spend time on this anymore. Okay. Now, how to use it, this template? It's very simple. Um, once in lifetime of a resource, you have to create it. It's clear. So typically, you have a volume group, a logical volume manager, and you create a logical volume with a certain size. Our biggest are around 40 terabytes in uh, certain exceptional cases. And you create a Mars resource, and after you have created it, it appears as dev Mars resource name at the primary side. Okay. And then you do place some data in it. If, uh, for example, you make a f new XFS file system, I should have better used ZFS here because you can also create a set pool here. And you can also trivially use uh, set pool import and export operations in uh, via um, systemd templates. I have, a, I have even implemented it, but I have not published it. I should publish it on GitHub. And you can also see wha what it looked like. So you can hand over complete set pools and ZFS instances, whatever you, you, you like. So I, there's no limit on what's inside of your block device here. OK, so you do this only once. And then you have to tell Mars once what's the start unit name and the stop unit name. And here you can invent new names which don't exist as a file in your file system. And then the macro processor of Mars will analyze it. And now I will go back one slide. Look here, this caret symbol here before unit means it matches against the file name, uh, against the unit name you have provided there, and it turns it into a mount point name then. Okay, so you have a uh, substitute operator, this is the, uh, the add symbol, and the caret symbol is the opposite, it matches against the given name. So you invent a new 
template name out of the blue you invented just by using it, and the microprocessor does what, do what I mean. Okay, so th that's the basic idea behind it. So you don't need to write, if you have 1,000 and we have 3,800 resources, we don't need uh, to write uh, 3,000 uh, versions of, of the same system to unit. We write it only once and the rest is done by the microprocessor, of course. So that's it. Uh, th that's the basic idea behind my presentation. Uh, well, an important point is Mars and also DRBD is in reality discriminating two scenarios. The one is the planned handover and the other one is the unplanned failover where something is breaking down. In the planned case, you want to ordinarily stop here at the old primary site then Mars is, when its U-mount is done, it may take some time. For example, if you have XFS instances and you have some uh, qu quota mounts and quota customers on it, it may take some time to sync all this quota information. I have corner cases where it takes a few minutes just to U-mount. It can happen in certain cases. If you have a few billions, uh, millions of inodes uh, and a few billions in total, it may happen. It depends on the file system and what the file system implement implementers did there. And also a mount may take some time for some time for journal replay and similar things. It depends on, on the use case and, and on your load and on your data and the data pattern there. And then uh, this head over protocol is ensuring that all of the data is appearing at the new site. And then of course final stages just started. So, and via this method you might even migrate the data to a completely other data center to a di completely different continent, whatever it is, because the sync, which is done uh, originally for creating a new replica, is running in background, with background priority, also on the network, with a lower network priority. You can even use traffic shaping, which is much different from DRBD. Try to traffic shape DRBD channels, don't try this. With mouse, you can do it, so you there you can see the difference. What's the difference between synchronous and asynchronous replication? And this means uh, it's also the same mechanism can also be used for migrating data to different locations for hardware lifecycle. If you want to get rid of your old hardware, I have done this for a few thousand machines uh, last year. My last year presentation was about this. And well, these are my final slides already. Um, Mars is GPL. It's a kernel module. Uh, it's on GitHub. The manual has much more than 100 pages, I think now, almost 200. I think this is very number is wrong here. Uh, it's productive since, oh, I have the wrong, what's going on here? Ah, okay. Um, something was missing here. Ah, okay. It's productive, in the first productive use is uh, 2014 and the first mass uh, is 2015, one year later. So we have now mass production for four years now, an enterprise critical data where the company is getting much of its revenue from, so it's enterprise critical usage. And well, we have a big number of servers here, for this, uh, the biggest server has around 300 terabyte on LVM level, and the biggest resources are 30 or 40 terabytes in some exceptional cases. Uh, in some cases, it's even a regular one. Typical sizes are only between one and three terabytes per container, per LXC container. Uh, total number of inodes already mentioned, and well, and we are concentrating many LXC. Uh, containers on one hypervisor, typically 7 to 10, in some cases 12 or more, it depends on the size. So you can dynamically, you can even dynamically grow and in some cases even shrink uh, the sizes, which is on the next slide. Football is a sub-project of Mars, uh, created last year for the originally for hardware lifecycle, but it's also used for load balancing. Because if you have an overloaded server with, let's say, 10 LXC containers and some customers are making trouble or you have some DDoS attack on one of them, you just migrate away one of them to another host. Well, it takes some time, it's not instant, but um, 
well, you, you can create the replica in advance if you are really curious about this. Typical times is for one terabyte, it's about two hours, and for the very big containers, it's more than one day, typical. It depends on the network, of course, and on, on some, some certain other, and on the load. If you are permanently overloading the system, of course, it takes longer, because the ordinary write back by Mars uh, takes precedence about uh, the migration process. This is clear. You want uh, so uh, the application does not feel anything about the performance, almost nothing about the performance of this migration in background. So I have my own scheduler implemented in kernel, which is a two-leg scheduler for implementing this. It has nothing to do with the ordinary uh, kernel schedulers for implementing this functionality here. It's in production. And we have the main operations are migrate to another, from one cluster to another one. Well, the downtime is very low. So for hardware lifecycle, you don't have mi uh, live migration anyway, because the hardware is changing from a very old IBM blade to a newer Dell hardware at the moment. And this means, or AMD, or whatever. And this means uh, you won't use any processor specific uh, functionality anyway. Then you can shrink. This is done via a local rsync. So we create uh, another file system with diff better parameters. For example, the AG count parameter is originally 10 years ago, it was only four, which is a performance bottleneck. You increase it to a bigger number if you recreate a file system there. Expand is online without downtime. It's just using XFS underscore growFS. Okay. So you can just dynamically increase your file system. You start automat it automatically does LVM, LV, uh, extend, and so on. L l as you're increasing the size of the dy of logical volumes everywhere in the whole cluster, regardless of number of replicas. Okay. Then do a mass RDM resize command, which propagates it up the layer, and then you simply increase the XFS file system size, then XFS GrowFS, and then they have more space there. And if the whole system is exploding because you have no space anymore, you move away one of the containers. That's the idea, load balancing via football. So in reality, you have a virtual LVM pool, which is spanning your whole data center. If somewhere some space is missing, you just make right, your container to some other machine, to some other cluster, Provided that networking infrastructures and the rest of your infrastructures, of course, must be constructed for that, but in our case it is. And so um, you don't need uh, a storage network at all with this system. This is the big advantage. Migration traffic is only occurring if you ne really need to migrate the data, and otherwise we have local storage in most cases. And many people are believing that you always need a, a network or you need a storage network so distinction between storage servers and client servers, but we don't have it. And with petabytes of data, it's possible, thanks to this online migration, which is possible with Mars. Think about it, it's much cheaper. You, you are not only saving the network and its costs, the storage itself is cheaper and the performance is much better because you don't have this network bottleneck in between. ISCSI is always a bottleneck. If you ever ha made a TCP dump of ISCSI traffic, do it and you will get pale uh, what's uh, uh, being done at the protocol level because iSCSI has to be backwards compatible to old SCSI protocols from the 1980s with resource and request slot allocation. This is overhead, overhead, overhead and uh, in Mars I, don't, I don't have all this overhead. So the local device which appears locally is certainly much more performant there. So I think now we have the last slide. Future plans. What I'm currently doing, I have not much time for Mars because my main job is a uh, downstream kernel, maintaining a downstream kernel which is then rolled out to more than 10,000 of servers in total. And I have certain special patches I should not talk about with dealing with security and several other things and uh, dealing with those billions of inodes and so on. Uh, so this is my main job and Mars is just uh, a, a side job or whatever you tell it, but in the last few months I had some time for implementing a few new features. I'm not sure whether it's interesting for you. The original Mars is a prototype from 2010-2011, originally designed at the lab, and there I used MD5 checksums in the transaction log. 
And these MD5 checksums are very important, I think, because they, we have, uh, they have rescued the lives of machines and of customers many times. Uh, on very old flaky hardware, with this hardware, BBU caches. 10 years old, the battery is going bad, and then you, uh, the RAM is uh, fading away, and you suddenly have RAM corruption. Okay, and this means in worst case, you are losing your whole data at the whole machine. Can happen. Therefore, you have the geo redundancy. And in these cases, typically Mars will uh, detect this because the MD5 checksums are wrong. And it refuses to apply the defective log files at the secondary side. You also get an error message. And then the sysadmins come to me crying, complaining, Mars is defective. So I say, no, Mars is correct. Your machine is defective. And you don't want to apply this data. Yeah, there's data loss, there's data loss. Yes, there's data loss. <laughs> there's no chance to deal with it because you don't want to apply this defective data. Otherwise, you, uh, your secondary side will be trashed. Please, primary minus minus force, switch over forcefully. And you don't want, uh, you want to have this data loss. That's the point here. So, uh, and this MD5 is unfortunately the most uh, is, is a performance peak in some sense. Uh, it consumes a lot of CPU. If you do MD5 with the user space uh, tool MD5, you will check it. Uh, I, I've timed uh, several CRC algorithms, and CRC uh, 32C is the uh, fastest one, according to my benchmarks, with uh, four K blocks only, because each block is compressed individually. So, of course, it's not the best compression, the best possible compression. But I want to re retain the property that each log entry is a transaction in its own. Therefore, I don't have longer compression runs, of course. So it's not a bug, it's a feature to have the small compressed blocks there. And CRC 32C is already used at the networking. The TCP ISP stack uses it in several places. So it's nothing new, you won't lose, lose really things and you don't need a cryptographically perfect hash there. It's not needed because it's against, not against attackers, it's against uh, defective hardware and similar things. But of course, in the future version, you will be able to select uh, among them. And if you have a lot of CPU power and will afford it, you can stick at MD5. But the new default will be CRC32. And I noticed in my test that my test suite is running much faster than before. I have not yet timed uh, the real impact on onto the IOPS. But I have certain cases where 40,000 IOPS are possible on a classical disk system without SSD local with rate 5 so if uh, if you if you want to dive in i can even explain why this is the case because it's even in some cases there are existing cases where it's faster than a raw device and i can explain why this is the case here so some other projects log file compression maybe is not uh, used at one and one i think because our data center lines are good enough but if you have a real long distance replication, let's say from East Coast Ast Australia to whatever, to West Coast or to Asia or whatever, or to, to another continent, it may pay off. I'm not sure. So it's compression at two layers. The log file itself, before being transferred over the network, can be compressed. And then the independent option is to do it only at the network transport. But you have one primary and multiple secondaries. You will have to compress it several times there. So I think both options are needed. Um, I, 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 I will provide both of them. And then there are another things. Scalability number of resources per host is not the best one at the moment because it has emerged from a prototype. This has to be improved. And I have certain ideas how to improve this. For example, having several controller threads per resource or similar things. More hosts per cluster will be is on my road roadmap, on my medium term roadmap. And uh, um, if you could have a big cluster with thousands of machines at metadata exchange level, where each cluster knows what the status of each other cluster, at least potentially with some higher update times, with the Lampert clock algorithms I'm using here, then split cluster, joint cluster operations wouldn't be necessary anymore. So you would have a true big cluster operations at metadata level, but the data I.O. path is preferably local one. So it, it would be very similar to big cluster approach like uh, 
Swift or Ceph or similar thing from, from the sysadmin perspective, from the operational one. Okay, then, well, I think this is something where I should get uh, more time to do because uh, at, at the moment I have no time for this and if it's not going upstream into the Linux kernel, it will not, I, I fear it will not survive in the long term. So this is something which needs to be definitely done here in the next years at least. Okay, then what's also lacking more tooling integration, it's at the moment it's more or less a component like the RBD and uh, support by other projects is not yet the best one, so this should be improved. So if other uh, OpenStack and several other projects, uh, if it would be integrated there, and the problem is I have no time for this, so community would be a good idea. If you want to do this, please talk with me, I will support what I can in order to integrate it in whatever tooling you already have or you like to have. So this would is the end of my talk. Then let's start with questions and I can also add some whatever you like in the appendix. I have some more slides. Yeah. I think you get a mic. Lenz has a question here in the first test. Um, you yeah. mentioned that MD5 checksumming is very CPU intensive. Does that already take into account that usually they have custom computation units on the die for performing these operations? Or yes. Is that um, not used within the Linux kernel? Um, yes, there are several hardware acceleration units available, but I fear that uh, we don't have them active at the moment, or whatever it is. So uh, they are either using the uh, Intel SSE and similar uh, uh, already using that. So I'm just using the kernel config as it currently is, and the current we have kernel 4.4, which is not the newest one at the moment, because you know in practice you need some time for getting it stable and so on, and uh, my timing says this at the moment. But, uh, well, in a, once I have published it, you can download it and test it, and please give me a response. So. But I think uh, th there's a reason that MD5 is the, small, is the slowest one. If you have not implemented it fully in hardware, it will be the slowest by construction. And there's a reason why the networking guys, not only from BSD, but also from Linux kernel, are using CRC32 C, there's a reason for it, I think, a traditional one, a very old one. And even with better s hardware support, either from AMD or Intel or both, or from ARM or whatever manufacturer, or from chipset manufacturers, and from the server providers, I think it won't change very much. Of course, it can help a lot, of course. But I have I've noticed that this is one of the bottlenecks of Mars. Okay. But this will be relinquished, of course. Um, yeah. What would be uh, the main advantage of using Mars over DRBD? Well, it's a matter of application use case. Uh, in the Mars manual, there's one chapter about DRBD versus Mars, and I clearly recommend for short distance replication where you don't have a switch in between, but a crossover cable, you should use DRBD because it consumes less resources. DRBD is constructed for this case, and Mars is not, at, at least uh, at the moment, it doesn't attempt to attack this in any way. Okay, so there's a clear separation. There's a gray zone, of course, in between of both. If you have long distance and asynchronous replication, don't use the RBD. You can buy this uh, proxy product, of course, but uh, we have tried it and uh, it's RAM buffering. It's expensive and, um, well, RAM is the most expensive memory you can buy. And the re recommendation would be to even have dedicated host only just for this buffering. And Mars does it all on the local host. So uh, even on our biggest machines, our 300 terabyte machines, the slash mass director has one terabyte, which is less than 1% of total memory for the slash mass transaction logs. And this works perfectly fine. So you typically are surviving an outage of one day without problems, typically. Except if you are restoring your fully restore of your full backup, of course, then okay. There are several corner cases where uh, it can be filled very quickly. But uh, typical user scenarios like in web hosting have around these sizes, and this is not a real problem there. Okay, Lenz, another question? Uh. 
Um, so how to get started? Let's say I have an existing server that already has LVM file systems on top and I would like to enable Mars. Do I need to copy data around first for this to happen or can I just... Um, Good question. Enable Mars. Uh, it's, it's this, yeah, it's described in the Mars manual. There's even a step-by-step -step instruction for this case or for similar case. Uh, you need some spare space on the, on your LVM for the slash Mars, of course. Let's say you could start with 10 gigs, but I wouldn't recommend it. 20 is the minimum. Let's 50 is better. Let's take 100 gig. Okay. To be, to be uh, if you have a, 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 a serious application, then you should use, let's say, 200 gigs for whatever. If you want a test setup, 20 gigs are enough for the first start, of course, yes. So you create the slash Mars file system. Your kernel should have a pre-patch. Newer kernels also work without a pre-patch, but uh, performance is worse then. And you need to compile Mars as an external kernel ma module, which is also possible via DKMS, and possibly, but I wouldn't recommend it. In the step-by-step instruction, it's described, and I even have posted uh, a module I'm not using, a D DKMS file. For, for You can try it, and if it has a bug, it may have, then please improve it or s send it back to me, uh, give feedback. So I have not really tested it, but uh, somebody else has created this, and uh, it's in the contrib uh, directory somewhere. And then you say mod probe Mars. And then you, the first instruction you have to give is on the previous slide, already mentioned there. It's, uh, no, it's on here. You are creating, you already have, the, for example, if you have already data there, which happens if you are migrating from DRBD to Mars, you have done this. Regardless whether you have internal metadata or external one. You had external one where it's a little bit sim simpler, but you can just directly use it because the DRBD metadata is at the end of the block device. Okay, So you will lose some unnecessary lose a few megabytes inside of your block device. You have to try to directly migrate it to Mars and, vi and also back. It's I, I'm insisting that it's possible to migrate back to DRBD again because this is open source and we have to work together. And uh, you ma make the mouse add in create results out of your volume group, with, uh, out of your logical volume, then the dev mouse appears on your primary here a few seconds later. And it has exactly the same content as your logical volume. It's one to one. There is no, absolutely no difference. Except, and now there come the exceptions, if your system has a power outage then it may be inconsistent, and then you have the recovery phase from the transaction log file. And this is very, very similar to MySQL. Yeah, if you have a MySQL instance, you know that it crashes, you need a recovery phase at startup of MySQL. You know this as an experienced sysadmin. Because this is the way how performance is optimized in databases. And if you know MySQL, and MySQL replication, MySQL transaction log replay and similar things, if you know this, then you also know like Mars, is working, and if you know DRBD, then you have 70, 80 percent of the commands. Also, it's very similar. Details are, of course, somewhat different, uh, but uh, as an experienced sysadmin, you will have no bigger problems, I think. Hopefully. So several people in our company have mastered it, and it's in use at several teams. Some of them are using it for a very different purpose, like in shared hosting. But uh, well. And I know that several people around the globe are also using it for long-distance replication somewhere. But I don't have exact statistics on users. No. Uh, <coughs> and how would this look for ZFS? If you have ZFS, would you replicate devices and then put a set pool? Ah, ZFS replication. Okay, this is a good question that I have addressed in the Mars newer versions of the Mars manual. Uh, there are some people who think that uh, making snapshots and then incrementally uh, replicating the snapshots uh, is this possible yes but there are two drawbacks at least at least the one is that you are losing some time the snapshots are point in time snapshots and the medium is a factor of 50 percent longer because you are replicating an old state during the replication of the old state of the new state it's changing in the meantime and if you do it by a script in an endless loop, which some people are doing, uh, then it runs a few seconds. And if it's 
increasing. If you are writing more data than can be replicated, the time is going up. And in some sense, uh, it may happen that the set of S is filling completely up and then you are in a real mess, typically, from practice, uh, from practical viewpoint. You should never exceed, exhaust the space uh, of, of your set volume. And these snapshots can be a serious problem. Mars also has uh, the same problem that uh, the slash Mars directory in the transaction log files may overflow. This is called emergency mode and there is a means for it, for dealing with this. So I have explicit means. This is the one thing. And the other one thing is Mars can individually switch over in short term, handover, both handover and failover. Here we have the planned handover. The unplanned failover is very similar to DRBD. You said DRBD, ADM disconnect and primary minus minus force. You just replace the DRBD by Mars. A ADM by Mars, ADM is exactly the same thing. So if you are using DRBD, this you will know this, and you also ha will typically have a split brain afterwards, also with the RBD, so there's not really a difference there. Okay, and this is per resource. And if you are doing with ZFS, you have no means for, for example, you may have replication in the wrong direction, you won't notice it. The R both the RBD and Mars are protecting you against this, so you have some control functionality in your kernel module and in the Mars ADM script and so on, which protects you from ex accidentally overriding your good data by the old one and similar things. And there's a table in the Mars manual with a comparison, uh, set of S versus DRBD at Mars, so three columns, and look into it and if you have uh, think that something is wrong there, we can discuss and I will correct it, of course, <laughs> uh, because I'm not uh, the big set of S uh, expert there. Uh, there are some cases where it could be beneficial if you are just creating backups, S snapshot uh, based backups. It could help and ZFS could be the easier solution in this case. But if you want to have instant failover to the other side, we are using it not only for the emergency case, even for ordinary kernel update, you know, spectrum meltdown. So we typically have a kernel update each one or two months, it's clear, at the, in, the, in the last months always, all the time. How is it done? You are rebooting the secondary, the currently secondary side with the new kernel and you just switch over then. And then, of course, you reboot the old primary side, which is now secondary. And the downtime is a few seconds to a minute or around this, depending on the XFS and the uh, uh, transaction replay and similar things. And uh, so a kernel update can be even done during business hours, if necessary. It's no big problem. Um, we have a small downtime because of the 50 kilometer distance. We have no mi live migration implemented at the moment. And you won't implement it with between different kernel versions anyway, too much. Uh, but uh, for practice, it's good enough. And um, well, and if you do it at midnight, then it's also no problem. So what's, what's the big problem there? So we are using it regularly. And it's isn't even another use case. So if you have 10 resources in total on one side, we have dimensioned it for this case. The machines are dimensioned for this, but sometimes there is an overload because customers are creating uh, endless loops uh, with backups. So copy minus A, your whole directory to a temporary space, and uh, then create a zip file. And if the zip file is created, it's copied once again. Yeah? This is typical script produced by customers. Yeah? You are laughing, you know it also. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and similar things. We have a few millions of customers, you can you can control all of them and they are just doing stupid things from a sysadmin viewpoint. And then, um, well, what do I doing? Half of the resources, it's data center A, the other half is running at B. Short term measure and it immediately uh, uh, relinquishes the load. Yeah? The load is going down. If you have an incident because high load, because some whatever is popping up because a DDoS attack also, well, we have a DDoS proxy and some, some measures against it, but whatever could happen, you have additional uh, CPU power on the other data center and then you just butterfly operation. Yeah? <laughs> one of the wings is the one side, the other, resources are running at the other side. That's the idea behind this. Uh, so this for sysadmin, it's even comfortable thing to have this handover feature. And in certain cases, you, you will, will start to like it. Okay, next question. 
So currently the failover of, or the handover of, of Mars is currently 99% done manually, if I'm understanding you right. I don't understand your question fully. What uh, we are using a lot of DABD resources, ah. um, and uh, we have integrated those, or we have controlled those with Pacemaker and DABD resource agents, yeah. where we can uh, define on which side the VM is running or the service is running, and uh, the handover is then done uh, by P Pacemaker. Yeah. And uh, even <laughs> we have also Geo clusters using DABD and Pacemaker. Yes, it's sometimes critical, but uh, Right now, everything works fine. Okay. Uh, but not not that high. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That high the availability. Output. Okay. Uh, for, for ah, high okay. availability yeah. reasons. You you are just uh, telling the same story because another team in our company has tried the same with Mars, uh, and uh, this a very similar experience. The problem we have we have ninety nine point nine eight percent reliability. We want to achieve. And we are violating only in very rare, rare cases. Okay, and this means uh, an error rate of one percent is way too much. Okay, so you whatever you are doing with pacemaker or whatever high-level cluster management, which tries to automate whatever things, you have to be very careful. And this is the reason why we are currently doing it manually. So there we have a 24/7 network operation center which survives. Uh, uh, uses, uh, watches everything in the whole company, including all those machines. And these guys are responsible for pressing the button, for pressing the button in the right moment, if they really detect an outage or whatever is happening there. Of course, it's losing some time if it's not automatic, but uh, at the moment we are operating this way and this has is the proven way. And uh, the experience is with the automatic uh, failover with pacemaker and similar uh, ideas is um, if you want to fail back or whatever, it sometimes has false positives, alarms and so on, and this could be too high. So this is just an experience, but I have not invested much time into it. So um, what you are right is it should be improved. Probably I should implant it on another cluster manager for long distance, where there is a, di uh, a distant, uh, different protocol in use, like Quorum consensus in a different way. And Mars already is at least potentially supporting this by the Lambert clock algorithms it uses internally. Because it has the metadata, the status information is propagated with event uh, eventually consistent protocol. So timestamps are compared. Lambert clock means if NTP isn't working correctly, correctly and your the clock on both sides are different and you send a message from A to B and B notices oh the message is created before it has been uh, no it's arriving before it has been created it cannot it's wrong so it's the own Lambert clock is advanced by this uh, by this difference by this delta and this means uh, the Lambert clock is a virtual clock which always is proceeding monotonically in, 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 uh, later in the time. So it's never running back. And this protocol en ensures that when you say on one side primary minus minus force and the other side is disconnected, as the network is, uh, is down for some reason, it may operate in split brain for a while, but once the network is healthy, it automatically reconnects. In difference to DRBD. DRBD, you have to, to, to do the command. Sure, in, 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 this yeah? Yeah, in yeah? our case, we have a three node cluster basically with a two way DRBD replication, and okay. the third node is for Chrome only. And if one side fails or the network disconnects and the one side with the better connection is still online and has the application running, and sometimes, yes, you have the possibility of a split drain which you have to manually recover. Yeah. But mm -hmm. um, that's, that's the downside of, of uh, the uh, DRPD failover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, th this is one of, one of the things uh, which is. Uh, I, I, I have a slide for it. I can explain why it happens also with DRPD because it's the cap theorem. The gap theorem is explaining why this is will happen uh, because once you have a network, it can fail independently from your nodes. Which has the network has its own failure. This is the P property. You will have the problem. Whatever you are doing, this is a fundamental law, like Einstein's law of speed of light. You, you just just no chance against it. Okay. So it's clear, and I think the cluster managers are not ready for this. And uh, I first have to think about it, how to implement it correctly, uh, at least as correct as possible. <laughs> because uh, full correctness isn't possible, it's just what the cap theorem is telling. 
It's not possible to do it always in the way you want to have it, but to do as best as possible. So the best effort principle here. And I'm not sure how to do it at the moment. Uh, I know that uh, there are some shortcomings. If you want to try it, I would be very uh, excited if you would try it and give me his feedback and what should be done better here. And if you want to have a good solution, we could start co-working. It's no problem. Yeah. So I think this is one of the things that is desperate neatly by some admins and by some use cases. I know, I have heard similar from, from many other te uh, uh, teams where I have already presented there and uh, there's a need for it. And currently not addressed and I don't have too much time at the moment for this. This is one of the weak points. Uh, but the problem is not spe more specific, it is also with the RBD. You're right. So further questions, uh, I think we are at the end of time now or not? Okay. But thank you for this very vivid discussion. So we had a lot of questions. <laughs> thank you. So there's some interest.